This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, thank you all very much for coming. It's great to see you all here tonight. And it's a real pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, who I first met in the archives, in the old archives in Paris back in about 2006. Yes, yeah. 2006. So Chris Millington is Senior Lecturer in History at the University of Swansea. He's the author of From Victory to Vichy, which was published with Manchester University Press in 2012 on veterans of the First World War and French society and politics during the interwar years. He's also the author of um, France and Fascism, which comes out next week with Routledge. It's um, a series of works on the 6th of February 1934. In July, his next book is coming out, (laughs) though I shouldn't invite people who make me feel inadequate, I think. (laughs) Um, In July, his next book is coming out. This is co-edited with Kevin Passmore on political violence and democracy in Western Europe, 1918 to 1940. That's coming out with Palgrave. And his talk tonight comes from his new project on political violence in interwar France, which so far has produced the important article in English Historical Review, which came out in June last year, Street Fighting Men, which is something for you to look at if you'd like to read more about it. But this paper is the future directions of this project. Yes, yeah, well, it's a part of, part of this project. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. Um, OK, I'm going to read my paper. Um, so let's begin. So on the 18th of June, 1930, a political meeting took place in the small commune of rosny sur seine which is 40 miles east of Paris. Now, this meeting was the latest in a series of meetings held by uh, the Centre de Propagande des Républicains Nationaux, um, which was an organisation set up in 1926 by the right-winger Henri de Kerelis. Now, these meetings were of particular significance because they were in the left-wing, uh, or they were in the constituency of the left-wing deputy Uh, Gaston Bergerie. Now, before the meeting, several coaches arrived in in the commune from the direction of Paris. The occupants of these coaches, of whom there were about a hundred, all wore the flat caps and tattered collars of workers. Now, they entered the venue and they mixed with the locals in attendance and they listened to several speeches. Now, uh, Kerry Lees gave the closing speech, and once he'd finished speaking, Bergerie himself stood up in the audience and requested the floor. No sooner had he begun to speak than a scuffle broke out at the back of the room. Now, according to several witnesses, a whistle blew and a cry went up, berets. The workers who had arrived from Paris cast off their berets and donned the caps of um, the Jeunesse Patriote, an extreme right-wing paramilitary league. And from within their coats, they produced truncheons and they began to attack members of the audience. Now, in the ensuing violence, the room was vandalised and several men were badly beaten. So, for example, a man, a 48-year-old man, a local of Rosny, Marcel Boulineau, um, he made for the exit as soon as the fight broke out, but he found that the exit had been blocked by a bench put across the doors at chest height. And as he tried to crawl under the bench, he was beaten from behind. 59-year-old Jean Vizier was likewise assaulted as he tried to escape. He was set upon by a group of paramilitaries who beat him with iron-tipped rubber truncheons. And with blood pouring from his wounds, he was hit a further two times on the floor. Meanwhile, 71-year-old Joseph Dupuis managed to escape only by climbing out the venue through a window. Now, following this fight, the JPs quickly returned to their coaches and they left for Paris. The gendarmerie managed to halt two of the vehicles on the road back to the capital. And inside the coaches, they found 19 truncheons, three clubs, two wooden batons, eight knuckle dusters, two automatic pistols, a revolver and a pair of scissors. Now, it's this sort of incident that my project into into war political violence for concerns so what i'm doing is i'm investigating violence in a variety of settings so violence in the street um and by that i mean encounters between activists uh, as well as riots and demonstrations um violence during strikes uh, police violence and of course violence in meeting halls 
and its violence in meeting also that I'm going to focus on in this paper. Now, before I get into uh, this discussion of meeting hall violence, I'm going to explain the historiography uh, of the topic and then explain what my approach to the, to the topic is. So firstly, the historiography then. Um, I've just got a couple of the key references on the PowerPoint. Now, the historiography of interwar French violence um, emphasises the fact that France was exceptional in Europe because of its peacefulness. It's not denied that political conflict was sharp. Um, in fact, politics polarised between the extreme right uh, and the left during the 1930s. Nor is it argued in the historiography that violence did not break out. We have two uh, examples of extreme violence in the 1930s. Firstly, the, the riot of the 6th of February 1934 in Paris. Um, and secondly, the, the Clichy massacre of March 1937. Um, and these stand out as two incidents of violence at this time. Yet it's generally argued that aside from these spectacular examples, in day-to-day -day politics, conflict rarely moved beyond the exchange of insults and threats in the press. Outbreaks of actual violence were infrequent and so rare, in fact, that uh, French historian Serge Bernstein has argued that the political conflict of the 30s was a simulated confrontation. Now, Bernstein's argument rests on the contention that the French that French political culture was inherently democratic. The argument goes that the Third Republic successfully educated its citizens in the processes of democratic participation. It channeled conflict away from the street and into the ballot box. Now, combined with this was the Republic's apparent ability to solve the modern problems of the 20th century, which further legitimized democracy in the hearts and minds of the nation. So in such a context, political violence was both marginal because the French were no longer prepared to resolve conflict in this way, and it was anachronistic because it was a tactic better suited to a, a pre-democratic past. And so Bernstein argues that if groups wanted to be successful in politics, they had to abandon violence and enter electoral competition. Now, historians of French violence have largely followed Bernstein's lead. So Georges Vidal has studied communist violence, and he has dis discerned what he calls a sort of collective sense of decency between activists and a reluctance to spill blood when they confronted each other. Eric Nadeau has studied socialist street politics, uh, and he claims that the, the party channeled the violent aspirations of activists into inoffensive street demonstrations, which allowed them to let off steam without fighting. And this is a similar conclusion reached by Andreas Vershing, who, who studied post-First World War politics. Um, and he concluded, too, that demonstrations were a safety valve uh, for violence. Now, I should add that there has been research that has taken a different approach to the topic. So, for example, Alan Douglas's work on the, the fascist group, the FESO, uh, in the 1920s, found that violence was a part of the political process of the Third Republic. This was his conclusion. Um, but it's still Bernstein's thesis that dominates the field. Now, if we look at the number of deaths attributed to political violence in France, the country does seem to have been more peaceful. So my research has found that 105 people died in incidents of political violence, and I've included strikes in that number between 1918 and 1938. Now, of these, 74 died in the period between the 6th of February 1934 and November 1938. So what we could call the, the period of most severe political conflict of the interwar years. Now, this number seems small in comparison uh, with numbers killed, say, in Germany, where um, an estimated 400 people died uh, between 1928 and 1933 alone. So I've got just this graph um, on the PowerPoint. So the years on, on the graph are the years of the mo most severe conflict in the respective countries. So we can see uh, the very uh, clear differences between Germany uh, and France and Italy and France. However, if we compare statistics like this, the results are necessarily relativised. So if we compared French deaths to German deaths, then yes, France looks much more peaceful. But if we compare the number of uh, French deaths to the number killed in Britain, 
as far as I know, or I've not come across any deaths from political violence in, in Britain. France looks much more violent in, in comparison. And we could see that Germany actually looks much less violent than Italy uh, on the graph. So having, um, having attacked the historiography, <laughs> what's my approach then? Um, well, firstly, as I've explained, I find it unsatisfactory to, to approach the topic based on the number of fatalities. Um, because what, what about incidents such as the one I described at Rosny? No one died at Rosny, but does that mean that that incident was not worth investigating? Now, I'm not seeking to exaggerate the severity or the frequency of violence. What I want to do is just investigate the incidents that took place to determine the place of violence in politics at the time, rather than simply dismiss it out of hand. Secondly, for me, Bernstein's approach assumes a straightforward relationship between verbal and physical violence. If groups were serious about being violent, they would have matched their threats with action. But if we look at examples of violence elsewhere, the reality is not so simple. In Italy, violent rhetoric was often matched with murderous punitive expeditions on behalf of the fascists. However, Sven Reichard has shown that in Germany, the SA made many threats that it rarely put into action, even in Nazi strongholds, because the police presence prevented them from doing so. Thirdly, throughout interwar Europe, Political groups combined symbolic menace with actual physical aggression. Both could be deployed in tandem or individually, and both were dependent on immediate circumstances. Now, of course, some agitators did commit premeditated acts of violence, and their leaders at times encouraged them to do so. But the outbreak of violence was often dependent on contextual and circumstantial factors, and this means we can't really read any essential meaning into it. So, for example, in November 1935, the Quadifer, which was a, an extreme right-wing group, fired on anti-fascist protesters in Limoges. Now, it's arguable that this violence would not have taken place if police had been present in sufficient numbers. Police made mistakes in their, their security operations, um, which meant that um, opponents came into contact with each other. Now, we shouldn't underestimate the role of the police in limiting French violence. They were often successful in limiting this, this violence, even if both sides were bent on perpetrating it. Now, the example of Limoges also, t also is instructive uh, in regards to circumstantial factors. So when quite a members fired on the anti-fascists there, it was because the driving rain and the pitch darkness in Limoges meant that they could not see the policemen protecting them uh, from the mob. So they thought that they were vulnerable to the anti-fascists and so they drew their revolvers and fired. Now, my main interest lies in explaining how antagonists behaved or were reported to have behaved during violence and how combatants and observers discussed, understood and represented this behaviour. So this approach follows recent research into cultures of violence, um, which have been defined by John Carter Wood as the frameworks through which aggression is understood, justified, condemned and controlled. And it involves examining the, examining the narratives constructed around violent incidents and discerning the undeclared rules and assumptions within. And it's this approach that I'll explain in the second part of my paper. So having outlined my approach then, um, I'm going to move on to the subject of the paper, political meetings, violence in, in meeting halls. Now, political meetings were an integral part of a group's uh, programme of activities. Um, they were held in locations large and small throughout France. So they could be held in theatres and cinemas, and these offered the advantage of fixed seating uh, and a stage at the front. Private rooms could be rented in a cafe or a hotel, or the local town hall might possess a meeting room uh, that could be rented by political groups. And it is in these venues that orators sat at the front of the room and spoke from a rostrum uh, or a lectern. Now, there were two types of meetings, private meetings and what were called public debates. Um, often they were called public and contradictory meetings in French. 
The type of meeting governed who could attend. So if you wanted to go to a public meeting, you didn't need an invitation. However, a private meeting required an invitation. Um, the invitation might have your name on it or it could be blank because groups are often issued blank invitations to try and attack, attract new recruits. At private meetings, only pre-approved speakers could participate and they were usually members of the organising group. On the other hand, at public debates, the speakers came from rival political groups. Orators from the organising group would generally speak first and then a contradictory speaker would respond and a further response from the original speaker could follow. And debates closed with the voting of a motion or the voting of a statement that was approved or rejected by the audience through a show of hands. This at least was the intention. Now the political meeting was meant to be the most democratic of settings. The freedom to, to meet was enshrined in the law of the 30th of June 1881. And for early Third Republicans, it represented a victory over the repressive practices of the Second Empire and also a foundation stone of the democratic regime. The public debate was intended to allow people to meet in a venue regulated by reason, in which passions would be diffused, politics removed from the street, and the democratic process anchored in the popular consciousness. It was, according to uh, Paula Cossar, who has written a book on political meetings, it was a laboratory in which the French would mature into Republican citizens. By the interwar years, the Republican emphasis on discussion and reason had largely given away to a theatrical and an effective appeal to the audience. Paramilitary politics had invaded the meeting halls with venues festooned with partisan flags attendees wearing insignia and songs and salutes being common. Uniformed hard men filtered new arrivals at the entrance and lined up in ranks at the front of the room to protect the stage. To hold a meeting in territory claimed by the enemy became a feat of daring and a matter of honour for both sides. And so Paula Cossar has said that rather than a place of democratic education, the meeting hall had become a political staging ground in which groups could demonstrate their numeric, numeric and symbolic strength. So it's perhaps unsurprising then that public debates had become, according, according to Paul Yankovsky, semi-institutionalised free-for-alls in which the presence of opposing speakers was a recipe for violence. Likewise, Kevin Passmore has, has argued that even in relatively calm periods, the meeting was an arena of ritualised conflict. And Alan Douglas, who I mentioned before, concluded that disruption at meetings often went beyond the mere heckling of speakers and involved the rushing of the stage, um, making violence in meetings a feature of Third Republican politics. Now, given the potential for violence, meeting organisers employed stewards such as these men um, pictured, these are members of the Francist uh, fascist group. Stewards were most useful at public debates um, where the, the likelihood of disorder was greatest, but they were present at private meetings as well, just in case the enemy attacked. These men were armed with striking weapons as a matter of course, so communist stewards were equipped with truncheons, while the Action Francaise advised its stewards to bring very solid canes to meetings. The Fezzo's legionnaires were armed with whips and pepper to throw in the eyes of assailants, while stewards of the right-wing Solidarité Francaise reportedly carried knuckle dusters, canes, truncheons, monkey wrenches and pistols. Now, firearms could come into play in meetings, but they were not habitually distributed by meeting organisers and activists were not required to carry them as a rule. So here's a couple of, or a few pictures of the type of weapons that were generally carried at meetings. They were weapons that were easily hidden in pockets. Um, razor blades could be attached to, to canes. Um, in the top right, that is a knuckle duster which was frequently carried by, by members of these groups. Uh, or the bottom left is a, a ring in the shape of a skull, um, which was no doubt very painful if you were hit with it. The interesting thing about the revolver in the bottom left is that it is the, it is the size of perhaps the palm of a hand. It's very small, um, which 
aided its concealment from police. Um, but it also explains the reason uh, behind why I read so many reports that people were shot and survived. Um, it is a, essentially a pea shooter. Um, but nevertheless, a, a, direct, a direct hit could be fatal. Now, for the protection of their meetings, um, the extreme right-wing league selected personnel according to their physical attributes and their so-called combative attitude. So the Franciste required solid and combative and perfectly trained men to guard the entrance, and these men had to be ready to fight um, in case of attack. The Jeunesse Patriote chose its stewards from the men who took part in its, uh, the group's physical exercise activities, and it said that they should be prepared to absorb blows from opponents and return them with interest. So preparedness for physical confrontation was paramount and organisers were sure to have a first aid kit on hand. Upon opening the doors to a meeting, stewards like these, these men, um, often wore uniforms and they, pre they presented an imposing sight that was meant to deter troublemakers. So at a meeting of the Franciste, um, entrants had to pass through two honour guards of armed and blue-shirted leaguers. Now the deterrent value of these stewards lay in the threat of violence. During a private meeting of the Action Francaise in 1933, police reported that there were 50 stewards in attendance, despite the fact that there were only actually 80 people in the audience. Francis stewards wore bandoliers and holsters in which the butt of an automatic pistol was visible. But the visible presence of stewards, while important, was not always required. Often they operated undercover. So jeunesse patriot stewards could dress like, for example, quotes, dress like carpenters with velvet trousers and caps to remain unnoticed in the audience. Now on the left, too, paramilitarism informed security at meetings. So following an attack on a communist meeting in March 1926, the Communist Party established the anti-fascist defence groups under the auspices of its veterans association, the ARAC. Now an ARAC meeting in March 1927 saw a man expelled under the blows of canes from these anti-fascist defence groups. After this has happened, the speaker assured the audience, we are men of action and by our discipline, we intend to make our enemies respect our meetings. Now it's likely too that the men in these defence groups were young communists. Because during the 1920s, the young communists were at the heart of the party's plan to form a Red Guard militia in France. These young communists operated in groups of 10. They wore insignia and they were armed with weapons such as truncheons. Now, the party abandoned plans to form this militia um, in the late 1920s. And it was at this time that the young communists took over security operations at meetings. And much like the paramilitary leagues, these stewards were selected from young men who practiced sport the communist uh, or, or took part in communist sporting provision. Preference was also given to men who had completed their compulsory military service because the party said that these men knew how to handle weapons and they were familiar with military tactics as well. Now the socialists didn't engage in the paramilitary politics of the 1920s but they nevertheless organised an uncompromising security service at meetings. At an anti-clerical meeting in January 1925, police noted that disruptive elements in the audience were violently expelled by groups disseminated throughout the room under the watchful eyes of the socialist mayor. Police sources believed that the party had organised a serious and determined police that was designed to expel anyone and they would not even allow a simple remark to be made from the audience. Now these stewards then were an important conduit through which paramilitary politics infiltrated the meeting hall. But they could be used in attack as much as in defence. So in circulars sent to the heads of the sections of the Jeunesse Patriotes fighting brigades, members were instructed on how to defeat the so-called left-wing bastards during a meeting. 
Leaguers were ordered not to sing or chat with comrades because this would give away their positioning within the room and it would give the enemy uh, an idea of their numbers. When the time came to attack, military cohesion was the watchword. The signal for the attack would come from a blow of a horn or a whistle, and the leaguers would immediately put on their berets and attack very violently uh, members of the audience with truncheons or whatever else came to hand, whether that was chairs, benches or tables. However, knives and revolvers were not to be used in case the enemy responded in kind. One group would be kept in reserve for so-called cleaning up operations, and a second blow of a horn would signal the end of the, uh, the, uh, the end of combat, at the end of the intervention. Now, during the 20s, the communists too conducted expeditions and sorties against enemy political meetings. And though during the following decade, the party discouraged this type of action, a number of activists were still intent on disrupting enemy meetings. So, for example, Comrade Campanelli of the Communist Southeast region criticised his fellow members for their allegedly timid behaviour at a right-wing meeting in June 1934. When he was asked whether the party's self-defence groups should not only commit or should not only operate to defend meetings but also to attack enemy gatherings too, he replied that they should not content themselves with just singing songs and chanting slogans to disrupt an enemy speaker. He said, the fascists are meeting, well, you must fight, get stuck in, those are the party's orders. He said that these action groups should comprise sturdy men who could fight and were not afraid to attack. Now, we shouldn't be under the impression that meetings always descended into violence, um, as much as I've concentrated on those types of meetings so far. They did often end peacefully, even when bitter rivals confronted each other. In March 1926, um, a communist speaker was allowed to speak at an Action Francaise meeting. So these were two very bitter rivals in the mid-1920s. And despite the fact that the communists in attendance were outnumbered by the Action Francaise stewards, um, the speaker was allowed to present his side of the argument and there was no violence. But for me, this demonstrates the unpredictability of confrontation. Um, and the, the ambiguity uh, of violence or, or non-violence in such a setting. Furthermore, if opponents did decide to disrupt a rival from speaking, they could do so without resorting to violence. They could shout slogans, they could sing songs. Um, and in some circumstances, it seemed that they were perfectly happy to do this without throwing a punch. We can only imagine the scenes of disorder at one meeting in 1933, when both speakers from the right-wing Taxpayers' Confederation and the left-wing Socialist Party could not make themselves heard because people in the audience were singing both the Marseillaise and the International. There were also musicians present to celebrate the third Thursday of Lent and they added to the cacophony and the meeting had to be dissolved. So what then determined the outbreak of violence during meetings? Now, I'm going to concentrate on public debates because there were controls in place to limit disorder. Public debates were subject to strict legal regulation. The law required that the audience elect a committee headed by a presiding officer and candidates for this committee were presented to the audience for their approval. And once elected, the presiding committee took up position uh, on the stage or the platform. And it was the job of the committee to ensure that each speaker had enough time to present their point of view. It was also the job of the committee to maintain order in the room. And if disorder broke out, the meeting became illegal and the committee had to dissolve it formally. Now, for a meeting's organisers, this legal obligation was a risky um, undertaking. Because to present speakers to the room for approval meant that opponents could elect a committee contrary to the desire of the organisers. So opponents could turn a meeting to their advantage in this way. Private meetings also carried a similar risk 
If opponents had acquired a large enough number of blank invitations, they could force the participation of an opposing speaker and make the private meeting public. What about the state authorities? Well, at times of extreme political tension, town councils could ban meetings altogether to avoid violence. Now, this was illegal to do this, but it's not clear whether councillors or mayors understood that this act was illegal. The matter was further confused in October 1935, when the Minister of the Interior sent, an, uh, sent a circular to prefects requiring that all demonstrations and meetings um, or all organisers of demonstrations and meetings submit a prior request for authorisation. Now, legal experts at this time remarked that prior authorisation of demonstrations was fine because actually there was no law that guaranteed the right to demonstrate under the Third Republic. But prior authorisation of meetings was contrary to the law of 1881, which guaranteed the freedom to meet. How about the police? Well, officers could not enter a meeting hall until the peace had been breached. However, evidence suggests that police tolerated low-level physical aggression at meetings. In September 1934, um, police reported on a communist meeting, and here's a quote from, from this report. So the session began at, at 9pm, it ended at 11pm, without any notable incident, some quite violent altercations, some punches were exchanged, but that was all. In August 1936, the Parti Populaire held a meeting in, in Reims, and the local superintendent witnessed the violent ejection of people from the meeting, and he said that they had clearly been beaten in the room. However, he decided that the, that the assaults were sans gravité, and he was satisfied to simply remind the organisers that if criminal offences were committed inside the room, the meeting would be dissolved. So it seemed to me that the beating of members and their expulsion was not, significant, or not sufficient enough for criminal offence for police to enter the room. Now, political groups seem to have shared this low-level toleration of violence. When a fight broke out, interrupters could be expelled, but the meeting would continue. The press even reported that if uh, speech makers were beaten or attacked, uh, in some cases the meeting could then go on with the speaker spitting blood as he gave his, gave his speech. Now all this gives the impression that fighting in meeting halls was so commonplace as to be accepted as long as more serious violence did not break out. In fact, during the meeting at Rosny, with which I began the paper, when a member of the audience informed the committee that he thought men had come from Paris to trouble the meeting, the presiding officer replied, you mustn't go to many meetings. Today, this is the only way that they happen. Now, when violence did break out, groups interpreted it according to um, what I called at the start of the paper, a culture of violence. Now, as I said, these, this, these cultures of violence are the frameworks through which violence was understood, through which it was justified, condemned, uh, represented uh, and controlled. And we can discern in the reports of meeting call violence that if the presiding committee, the law, the police and the stewards attempted to limit disruption, responsibility for order also depended on certain unspoken rules within the venue. Now, what this means is that groups seem to share understandings of meeting hall etiquette. Rhetorically, at least, all groups agreed that confrontation was to co be confined to oratory alone. Arguments rather than fists would defeat a rival. Now, to defeat an opponent in debate was to humiliate him in public, something that was called dégonflage. Now, in 1928, the Jeunesse Patriote advised sections to invite opposing speakers, preferably those of some importance, to attend a public debate, because the essential goal was to critique a rival's programme and defeat his arguments. On the left, the communist Jacques Doriot uh, chastised his comrades in 1931 for fighting at a debate, because he said that everyone had the right to express their point of view and he advised comrades 
to retain their self-control during public debates. Opponents who attacked a meeting before debate could take place were portrayed as unreasonable brutes. So following communist disruption at a FESO meeting in 1926, the attackers were described by the right-wing press uh, as, uh, well, the right-wing press reported, one reads on a good deal of their faces, not the desire to understand, not the desire to reason, to persuade, but the blind willingness to hit, to destroy, and let's say the word, to kill. Instead of free discussion, they had offered debate through uh, blows from their fists. On the left, too, um, the Jeunesse Communiste uh, in uh, July 1933 suggested to the Action Francaise that if instead of hitting us in the gob with chairs, um, the stewards came to discuss our ideas with us, we could make them understand our point of view. Now, during meetings, to deny an opponent the right to speak was deemed cowardly. Um, and granting, um, and though granting the opponent the right to speak did not guarantee a peaceful meeting, to deny him this right increased the risk of violence. Such was the reason that the Quad of Fur offered for its attack on a meeting in November 1931, when it claimed that it did not usually resort to violence at meetings, but in the face of such a lack of courtesy, it had no choice. Consequently, all groups prized good speech ma making. Um, the right wing leagues celebrated their speakers for precocious talent, for their fine and healthy intelligence when speaking. Uh, the leader of the Quad de Feu, Francois de la Roque, was reported to be an effective orator because of the charm of his speech, so simple but vibrant and persuasive. And on the left, uh, socialist, the Jeunesse Socialiste rewarded its best speech makers with books by left-wing uh, intellectuals and luminaries. Now, as well as being competent public speakers, orators were expected to behave in a certain manner as well because a speaker's conduct was thought to reveal his character as a man. So right-wing uh, speakers were celebrated for their peerless courage in debating at left-wing meetings. Francis leader Marcel Bucard was praised for the frankness of his speech, while the Quad de Feu congratulated its speakers for their song -fois. Now courage, fr frankness and song -fois were all associated with manliness in the contemporary imagination. The communists too prized this masculine behaviour from their speakers. So describing a meeting hall confrontation between Maurice Torres and Leon Blum in 1930, Humanité reported that the communist speaker had unmasked the lies that Blum, this refined intellectual, this juggler of ideas had told in contrast to the proletarian strength and the rugged openness of Torres. Now, good oratory of meetings was therefore interpreted as a public display of masculinity, and competent speakers were often said to have dominated or mastered their opponent and the audience. Now, what's interesting is that the poise, the measure and the honesty required of speakers was similar to those expected of an accomplished fencer who displayed calm under pressure, self-mastery and politeness. Um, and this is according to the work uh, of Robert Nye on, uh, on Third Republican Fencing Halls. Now indeed, public debates were sometimes depicted as duels between rival speakers and oratorical ability could be framed in combative terms. So the extreme right-wing Solidarité Française hailed its leader uh, for his words that was said to hit adversaries truly like blows, while Mo Maurice Torres's speech making was reported to lash like a whip on opponents. Poor speech making drew attack and ridicule. Communist speakers were described in the right wing press as gesticulating, making themselves hoarse with obscene gestures, acting like broken puppets before fleeing from the meeting hall. Now, significantly, a poor speechmaker, like a poor swordsman, was said to have resorted to violence because he let emotion and fear creep into his performance. Poor quality speechmaking led to a dangerous loss of self-control because speakers saw defeat imminently approaching 
and appealed instead to the emotions of the crowd. Returning to the incident at Rosny with which I began the paper, the left-wing press alleged that the violence had stemmed from the fact that right-wing speakers had been defeated at previous meetings, and thus on arriving at the meeting in Rosny, they decided to, decided to use violence instead of words. On the other hand, uh, Henri de Kerelis blamed the violence on Gaston Bergerie's poor showing at the rostrum, describing him as a deceitful speaker who was used to easy victories, and when confronted with competent opponents, um, he had lost his swagger and ordered his supporters to attack. Now, of course, we must bear in mind that such interpretations came after the fact, but it's nevertheless significant that groups sought to explain and justify their violence retrospectively, according to shared understandings of the rules. And this was in the case even in apparently premeditated violence, such as the violence which broke out at, at Rosny. Now, the culture of violence in the meeting hall um, was similar to that which governed violence in the street. In reports of street violence, political groups contrasted the discipline and the self-control and therefore the manliness of their own members with the fear, the rage, the cowardice and the emotion of their opponents. Importantly, to attack was read as a sign of weakness, especially if the attack was deemed unfair or deceitful. Yet violence perpetrated in self-defence and revenge was perfectly acceptable as long as it was framed as punishment to correct the enemy's unmanly behaviour. In such instances, this revenge violence drew on the lexicon of corporal punishment and chastisement. So terms such as correction, punition and châtier were commonly employed to describe beatings. These beatings could be just, necessary and beneficial, or they could be well-deserved or due, implying that the victim had broken a rule. Groups might even take pride in their violence, describing beatings as well-administered, first-class or proper. And so in the culture of violence in interwar France, groups connected manliness with both the calmness and self-control in the face of provocation and with self-defensive violence when attacked. So to conclude then, what does all this tell us about the political culture of interwar France? Well, what I'd suggest is study of violence in meeting halls suggests that a culture of violence existed alongside a democratic culture uh, in the setting of the public debate uh, and alongside the freedom uh, to meet. Now, while there were official rules to limit the outbreak of disorder and unofficial rules too, democratic debate could not eradicate violence. Importantly, groups justified and rationalised their own violence with reference to common understandings of acceptable behaviour. In principle, confrontation was to be confined to the verbal jousting of rival speakers and an orator's self-control, his honesty and his discipline and therefore his manliness were lauded. Indeed, for political groups, there were few better places to demonstrate their masculine posturing and bravado than on the stage of a meeting hall in the face of the enemy. Conversely, when enemy speakers fail to live up to the standards of courtesy and honour expected of them, their loss of self-control and emotion was said to prompt violence, but it was also said to deserve violence in return. To conclude then, if, as John Carter Wood has argued, the discourses and practices of violence elucidate social meanings which allow us to get closer to the mentalities of a given society, the study of political violence in interwar France suggests that within a democratic political culture there was still room for violence as long as it was interpreted and represented in a very specific way. Thank you.